In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer questions asked by listeners like you. They go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. They post a question underneath the quoi meme. Le quoi. And then we pick the best ones and answer them. Um, but before we get into that part, we do our introductory conversation. This is where we talk about ourselves. I bring up studies, random things, and we oftentimes mention some of our sponsors. Here's what we talked about in this episode. So we start out by talking about uh, Senegal Wrestling. There's a world champion over there that's going to be going over to the MMA world. This dude watch is out. massive. Uh, it'll be fun to watch. Um, then we talked about Adam using the sauna, the clear light sauna. This is infrared to wake his body up. As you guys know, Adam is a brand new dad. Yeah, and uh, he's, he's a little sleepy. He's not getting good sleep, uh, but the sauna does help reset the circadian rhythm. It's actually one of the more effective ways of doing so. So if you find your sleep rhythm off, Use a sauna and see how that helps you out. Uh, by the way, they are one of our sponsors. We do have a hookup for you. If you go to infraredsauna.com forward slash mind pump, you can get up to $600 off when you mention mind pump. Ooh. So yeah, that's an awesome deal. Then we talked about our kids getting sick. Uh, poor Justin uh, mm. playing Dr. Mom over there. Yeah, man. Um, he is giving them uh, herbs and stuff and he's doing it for himself to prevent himself from getting sick. One of the products that we both like to use uh, to prevent ourselves from getting ill is Organifi's Immunity. This is a powder you put into some water, you shake it up, drink it, and it's got compounds that help boost your immune system. Uh, if you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and use the code Mind Pump, you'll get a full 20% off. Then we talked about Christian Ronaldo's Nike deal, a billion dollars? Yeah, what a steal. That's insane. Uh, Justin brought up uh, Allison Felix for Nike and how they might have screwed themselves up a little bit there. I talked about studies that are showing when calories are presented on food, but in relation to how much activity you need to do to burn those calories, people tend to make better choices. That's cool. I talked about how to figure out what your body signal is that helps you dictate or should help you coach and dictate what you eat and what you do for yourself. Then we talked about LSU using big data to get make their football players even better. And then we talked about how Disney may be raking in $10 billion this year, first movie studio ever to do so. Kind of crazy. Damn. Then we got into the questions. The first question was, what are some good compound exercises for adductors and abductors? So what, what are some good movements for both of those areas? Adductors are the inside of the thigh. Abductors are on the outside of your thighs. Next question, this person's been working out for a while with no weight belts, no wrist straps. As they get stronger, should they use them to get to increase their safety? So in other words, if you've been working out for a while and you're getting pretty strong, should you start using a belt? Um, is there value to, to doing so? Next question, this person wants to know what kids' nutrition should look like. So we talk all about uh, feeding our kids and what that looks like and the challenges around feeding your kids properly. And the final question this person wants to know what would we what would we do if we took over the everyday regular gym? Like how would we go in there and help it improve its success? Gym makeover. Also, this month, Maps Aesthetic. This is our bodybuilding physique competitor and bikini competitor inspired program. Is fifty percent off now. This is a whole workout program. You go in, you've got workout demos, videos. Uh, exercise blueprints. It's an entire workout designed uh, and focused on aesthetics. In other words, if your main goal for working out is changing the way you look, sculpting and shaping your body, MAPS Aesthetic is the program. Again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsblack.com and use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0, no space, for the discount. You uh, you guys watch MMA a lot. I know you do, Adam. Yeah. Quite a bit. So, I do all the time. So there's this new fighter that's going to be doing his, he's going to be doing a professional MMA debut. Debut. Uh -huh. It's not at uh, UFC or, I don't know, I couldn't, I couldn't say that for a second. <laughs> debut. It's a debut. <laughs> uh, he's he's not going to be fighting in UFC or anything like that, but it's his first professional fight. He's a pro uh, Senegalese wrestler. Have you ever guys seen, no. have you guys ever watched wrestling in Senegal? No. no, like what, what's the difference? So these dudes are, so I'm huge into the grappling arts and sports, right? I did jiu-jitsu for a long time. And at one point I wanted to know what other forms of wrestling exist. Yeah. Like there's Turkish, uh, there's a form of wrestling in Turkey where they 
oil themselves up and then they wrestle and the oil is to prevent grip or whatever. Oh my God, I'm getting so turned on. <laughs> nah, it's not like that. Yeah. And, and those dudes are freaking beasts. And of course, you have Greco Roman wrestling, you have you right. know, your traditional collegiate wrestling. There's a catch wrestling, which was uh, one of the original forms of submission wrestling in the US or whatever. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Judo, Sambo, like all these different ones. And there's a there are very popular sport in Senegal, which is a, a, a country in the or a, a segment in the air in in the continent of Af- Africa, mm-hmm. where they do this form of wrestling where they wrestle in these huge sand pits, and the goal is to have someone hit the ground. You got to throw them on the ground, and they have they fill arenas. Really? Like, yes, like it's a very popular sport. But anyway, the reason why it's so awesome is when you watch these videos on YouTube, some of the biggest. <laughs> Dudes you've ever seen in your life, like these dudes are beasts. They're, Massive. they're not on. There's there's no anabolic steroids. I mean, like, not, like, so Samo- like yeah. Samoan big or like how big? Like, like that's like well, sumo wrestling. Those are some of the biggest humans we have. Like buffed, like yeah. massive, okay, giant, just huge people. And this one guy is 6'5", 285 pounds, and he's just if you look at him, bro. Oh my god, he can walk into a bodybuilding stage. Anyway, his name is I don't know if I'm pronouncing uh, Umar Kane. And he's going to be doing his uh, his debut soon. But you guys got to watch some of his oh, videos. Wow! Where yeah, he's he's wrestling exciting. other massive dudes, and he just picks them up. Two eighty five. Two yeah, six five. And he's oh my god. And these wow. dudes are like these guys are not training in the U S. They're not like who, I can't who even do you imagine. put up against that guy? Brock Lesnar. No, yeah, no, Brock. I, right. I no how idea. much? Did, how much does Brock weigh? Because remember when he hit the scene, that was a big deal. Because just up how, there, and he actually with without any real skills, he did okay because of how just. Big and athletic, he was. Oh, he's got to be at least two sixty five up. Yeah, you know? he's he's a he's big probably boy. more than that. Oh, there he is. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's gonna destroy people. He's gonna. I mean, I mean, if he can, if he can do well, the if rest he has of skills, it. yeah. But you watch the wrestling match. How did you, you come across did. this? Well, I, so I follow. Um, you know, I belong to a lot of groups on Facebook, and uh, there he is, right there. And uh, so you can see the style of wrestling, and there's like, these arenas full of people. And the way they showboat, it's hilarious. After yeah. he like defeats someone, it's almost like sumo wrestling a little. Kind, kind of, but these guys are. Yeah. You can look, look, how he, look how he walks but around. They're not pushing. They're look how he walks to around. Slam him after he wins. That's that's his thing right there. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyway, these dudes are are massive. He's I mean he's born to fishermen. You know, probably didn't grow up very wealthy. So I can't imagine what these guys are going to do with the potential. It's crazy when you see some of the stuff. Yeah. Just that's like super heavyweight, dude. Yeah, just the genetics that exist in the world. <laughs> do you do you think they should have like an extra category? Because once you get to a certain weight, I, I forget. It's unlimited, what, right? Yeah, it's unlimited. Like, mm-hmm. do you think there should be some sort of a? Nah. No. Yeah. Nah, I think it's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in Japan, they the Japanese MMA organizations. I don't know if they do this anymore, but back in the early 2000s, they would do fights like that where they would have one guy that was like 160 pounds against Well, you remember the, 260 the original pounds. UFC started that way. Yeah, it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it was... I, I, I loved watching that, but there's a there's a point where size matters. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you're... Because there's there's a point where somebody has that much mass that even even somebody who's got, got fighting skills, yeah. uh, you hit... If you're a 150-pound guy and you throw the biggest you're punch... You're not doing damage. The throw, biggest punch of your life on a 280, dude, it doesn't even... Uh, well, so, okay, you're right to some extent. 150 right? on a 280 a guy. A 150-pound pro boxer will put a 280-pound dude to sleep. They'll put him to sleep, hundred uh, oh, percent. He, he connects. He's gonna make you go nine night. Yeah, one if, if they're only boxing, bro. Have you ever? Have you guys ever? Yes, I, I've actually. I'm, so my one of my first experience, like like boxing, which I have no boxing skills whatsoever. My buddy and I, we went on a, we were on a, this kick for a while, and he's my size. We're like exact same size, and uh, he had a couple dudes that were they weren't professional boxers. Okay, so obviously my story is not uh, some professional boxer that I was getting in the ring with. They played I mean, Mike Tyson's punch out. Like, yeah, yeah. That that's, was that's, that's, a, that's a qualification. <laughs> they were really good on right, right, yeah, yeah, they, 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 they watched a lot of boxing. They watched a lot of. They watched all the Rockies, right? So yeah. that's what the, that's what qualified. No, uh, they you know they were they were on the circuit and trying to make their trying to become you know a pro, yeah. right? They weren't not, by no means were they at all. But I mean, talented boxers, far more talented than I was. And they were the ones kind of teaching us uh, the skills and drills. And, you know, we were kind of doing this training for a while. And it was fun. And then every once in a while, we would we would get in the ring and we would, we would spar. 
And, uh, I, and I'll tell you what, the, the thing that I have the most challenge with is like um, breathing with a mouthpiece for more than one uh, round. Yes. Yeah, so I, not- by round two, I'm like slobbering all over myself, trying to catch my breath. It was a mess. You but, don't realize how big of an impact that makes to you. No, it makes yeah. a huge difference, yeah. right? So I, I, I'm boxing my buddy, and you know because we're similar in size, we, we square pretty nice. So the little guy gets in with me, and again, I have no skill, but because of my size, like he he has he couldn't I could just keep him away the whole entire yeah. time. Just yeah. it was it was unfair, yeah. and he was way more skilled than I yeah, was. Yeah, no size definitely makes a difference, but skill makes the biggest difference. Can size outweigh skill? Um, yeah, at some point it, it definitely can, but m- more so when you're when you're striking, right? More so mm-hmm. when you're punching and kicking. It's even less. It's less of an impact when you're grappling, like in, in jujitsu. Yeah, because you use leverage. Yeah, in jujitsu, I think jujitsu is one of the only full contact sports that I know of where they actually have absolute divisions in their tournaments, uh, where anybody can sign up at any weight, and oftentimes the champion is not the biggest guy. Like uh, there was one uh, one grappler. What was his name? Marcelo Garcia, I think his name was. Who, 180 pound guy or 170 pound guy? And he was just he was just you crush everybody on the ground. But it does make a difference. It definitely, it definitely makes a huge. Like if you have two good fighters and one guy's way bigger, yeah, they're gonna have the advantage. But well, skill? I think these days too, like uh, I think it's evolved so far, like compared to like the early days of the UFC. You know, it was kind of yeah. like, what's gonna happen? You know, yeah. it, now it's like they kind of have an understanding. They need to learn certain yeah. skills in order to defend themselves properly, get out of situations. Like you know, you can't. I don't think you could pull the wool over an eyes of of you know a guy that big. Like he's gonna know that like you're gonna try and get him on the ground, lock, lock his legs, all this kind of yeah, stuff. There's a uh, you guys ever read stories about like Andre the Giant? Uh, I mean, I saw that documentary. Yeah. That was great, but so, no. Andre the Giant was, how tall was he? Seven something, 450 yeah. pounds. I mean. Yeah, seven two maybe. You, you read the, the, the reports of the wrestlers that would wrestle with him, and you guys know it's, it's staged, but they right. still throw each other. And they oh, still, absolutely. Oh, dude. And they said that if that everybody, people were, Andre the Giant apparently was a really nice guy, but mm-hmm. if you pissed him off, oh, yeah. everybody was scared because they knew that if he wanted to <laughs> yeah. during the match, <laughs> yeah. he would. He would kill you. If he, he gives really- you fifty percent instead of ten. Yeah, you seven, know? and then you're oh, seven you're foot hurt. four. How, what was his? Weight? You know, part of what four made him seven pounds? four. They, oh you my know, God. Uh, they talk about him in, in Bret Hart's uh, book, and part of the things that they talk about him uh, five twenty. <laughs> That's a big. Human a lot of people think he was there just because of how massive he was, but he actually was really talented mm-hmm. as far as like his ability to. Because that's the thing, right? Like the wrestlers are are really particular about. Who they who they wrestle with because it, it can make all the difference of a match because it's a show right but you're trying to be and they still have make, egos clashing and well, yeah ready. exactly yeah. right and some guys are just they're they're rough with their throws they their technique is weak and stuff yeah and he was one of those guys that was really good in that but to your yeah. point Sal like the, in the book he they could talk make about himself that. light yeah they, they talk yeah. about times where he would like take it out because he had get somebody who was. Uh, well, unskilled. 520 pounds, Dude, seven Hulk foot Hogan four. Hulk Hogan lifted him up. Well, and but well, okay. So Hulk Hogan talked about him, and Hulk Hogan's like he said that one time they were messing around, and Andre the Giant just decided just to hit him on the back, just a little harder than normal, and he's like he almost broke my back. <laughs> This is a far, 520 pounds, seven foot four. That's what four. I mean by like we're sized. There's a point of where course. like it's yeah, that it's much mass that you're moving. And then to hit him, he's so, he's like a big, massive dude. He like, could do five, think about that. 520 pounds, that's a heavy ass deadlift. Yeah. <laughs> he could literally grab you, lay on you, and then go to sleep. And yeah. you're not going to, you're there until he wakes up. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, yeah. you do that, I do that to my kids sometimes. Uh, I'll fuck with them and I'll, yeah, just I'll hold smash them down. Him. And I'll just lay down and pretend like I'm asleep. Well, Brock Lesnar did that. I forget like who he's fighting. The first time, like you know, he lost. Uh, you know, his his first bout because like he didn't know the techniques yeah. of you know and grab. But then he just basically like manhandled. You know, just like pushed Frank down Mir. Frank Mir. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. He's a uh, but Brock was also a collegiate wrestler. Well, yeah, like he's, champion. yeah, of course. He's, yeah, he knew what he was doing. Wrestling skills. Yeah. Speaking of sleep, man, I just my son. I tell you, is on a like a regression. I don't know if it's a regression right now or it's uh he's he's been fighting this cold for like the last week oh yeah yeah oh, yeah no. you yeah you did look a little zombie-ish oh, yesterday. Yeah. yesterday was fucking tough dude yesterday i was really tired i was up at five also so like i was up early and it was a rough night all night and i was exhausted yesterday when we were here and this you know I, as soon as we were done recording i went home to go lay down take a nap and you know when you pass that like you're so exhausted you can't sleep 
it almost gets becomes delirious or yeah, whatever. Yeah, uh, you're you're basically uh, like your your adrenaline is high. Your, I was gonna say, is there something energy? Goes is there something physiological that happens to us that actually causes that to where it's like because it's very. I think everyone has experienced it where you know you're exhausted. You're you're running on very little sleep, but then all of a sudden I can't sleep because I'm so exhausted. Yeah, I think it's a combination of you got a lot of shit to do. You know what you need to take care of. Plus you're tired, so your body probably squirts out. Tons of cortisol and adrenaline to keep you going. So yeah. I go, I go home. I I lay down right and try and sleep. Katrina was exhausted too, so Nanny was over there. She can't. We both had like the same idea. We both come home real quick from work. I think we got there at like two thirty or three, and uh, I, I show up. I knew she, Katrina was there, and I knew she had a rough night, obviously too. Um, obviously, she's the one who's handling him more more often. I'm just because my sleep was broken and I was up early. And uh, Nanny's like, "Oh, Katrina's up sleeping." You know, I'm like, oh, great. I'm going to go up there too. So I go up, climb in bed next to her and I lay there and I kind of feel like I'm, I'm in and out. I can't fall asleep. I probably lay there for about a half hour, 45 minutes. And then I pop back up. I actually call Doug and say, hey, turn on the, the sauna. Hey, get in here, Doug. I'm going to get you. <laughs> yeah. I need a snuggle. I need a teddy bear. snuggler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I tell him to turn the sauna. I knew he was at the studio still. So I haven't turned the sauna on and then come back. And I tell you what, man, and I think I've shared this before and it's just fresh in my mind again because it happened last night, uh, of all the benefits I know they talk about with the infrared sauna, the the thing that I feel the most and notice is, though, is when I have days like that, where my circadian rhythm is completely thrown off, I'm exhausted like that, I'll come in here and I just, I laid in there and stretched for like a good 45 minutes and just got a real good sweat. And you feel a boost of energy afterwards? Oh, I just, I feel reset. I feel, re yeah. I feel mm. like, I, and then tonight, last last night, I, I went to bed in our time, great night's sleep, and I feel back to 100%. It's wow. just and and I and I know Ben Greenfield was the first person to share that with me that anytime he flies and there's time change especially if he's going overseas, he's like the first thing he does is he looks up a place that has an infrared sauna and he gets in it to help reset his I remember that him saying and I I tried doing that when I went to to Scotland. I just couldn't find any infrared sauna places anywhere like or any gyms that had, you know, access to that. So, yeah, I'm still like I would love to try that out like uh, especially it, on a time of, difference. Of all the benefits, because there's a lot of benefits that you get from infrared sauna, um, and we've talked about it at uh, nauseum before on this show. But the the one that I like feel like instantly, like mm. you know, and everyone's always looking for that, right? That's why supplements sell so much because you feel them right away, right? Mm -hmm. The thing that I feel the most from the infrared sauna in comparison to everything else is exactly that: is the times when I know I'm exhausted, I know my circadian rhythm is off. I go in there, I mm -hmm. sit in there for a half hour to an hour. And it completely resets me. It feels well, amazing. Well, there were those big studies that were done. Uh, I forgot what countries they were. I think it was one of the Scandinavian countries that showed uh, a dramatic reduction in all-cause mortality mm -hmm. from people who used saunas regularly. All-cause mortality. Yeah. They showed a sort of reduction in, in big one in uh, heart disease or heart-related death, uh, cancers, and then illness, just general illness. It's 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 like anything else in the body. It's a muscle, um, and your body's ability to acclimate to hot and cold. It uh, we don't ever train it. We never exercise it because we're in such you know yeah. comfortable conditions all the time. So it makes sense that when you strengthen that back up, it just creates more resilience in your body. Yeah. So I mean that's the that's the main reason why I use them. Yeah, I've been I've been having a similar issue. Well, like uh, so my youngest has like flu like symptoms of the past like four days. We've pulled him out of school and everything and oh, he's really? oh my God. He's he's been burning up like with a fever and everything. So it's so, going around right now. Yeah. So it's 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 rampant it's right that now. Time of year, dude. Yeah. So I've been I've been like just trying my best. To, so I've been like, it's been affecting my workouts a little bit too. Cause I, I started to like really ramp up my workouts, but then I'm like, I feel beat. And, uh, you know, it's like, I feel like when I, if I keep going in that direction, I, I open myself up, you know, to being more susceptible to it. So I've been do you, like, do you supplement? Do you, what do you do for all that? I do. I, I'll supplement like, uh, so zinc and elderberry, and then also this immunity, uh, from, from Organifi too, that I've been kind of pouring in and making sure that I'm getting ahead of it. So Sal's least, used that a lot, and I know. You, so is this the first time you use it? Or have you been using it? Have you used no, it? No, I've used it before, and, and you know I, whether or not it works. It's for me, it's been something that's really helped to kind of keep me going and not feeling like run down and like I got that scratchy throat feeling. You know, when you start to kind of feel a little twinge, mm. that's immediately when I start yeah. The, the the best way to use natural remedies for viruses is to have them uh, pre right before right. or at the at the very 
early, front end. On the earliest part, right? Because yeah. at the point, they, they don't they do they do nothing for you if you miss the window, right? Um, well, elderberry still can re, can can re, seem studies show that will reduce the 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 severity and the potential length of like having the flu. But it's best used before, before you get it, or right when you get it, and then there's a huge, there's a much larger impact. So, what I, I do, what you do, Justin, where either if I start to feel something, I'll use those things, or if I'm around people, yeah. So if I'm around sick people, then I'll just start taking it anyway, yeah. and it's not going to hurt you to take it, um, you know, uh, unless you're taking way too much zinc, um, which might cause a deficiency in. I think it's copper, hmm. um, but uh, but unless you supplement all the time with zinc, you're probably fine. I've just learned to get ahead of it, man. You so, know, like you see it around, you see other kids around that are hanging out with my I kids. We're it, all sir. just trying to get ahead of it, so it doesn't happen. So I'm gonna, t- so I'm get right after we get off this of the mics today. I'm, I'm hopping on a plane right now, and so I'll. That's what I would like to use to. It's because it's, basically it's like a better version of Airborne, right? So oh, yeah. loading yeah. up on on an immune boost, a boosting supplement before I go in a place that where I I am yeah. probably most vulnerable, like yeah. trapped but, in a plane. With a bunch of people coughing and, and that's shit. probably for you oh, important because yeah. you're like the number one thing is lack of sleep yeah number one thing for for me if i'm no sleep it's like i'm you know wide open to get sick yeah if i get good sleep sometimes i'll feel like i'm getting sick i'll get a good night's sleep wake up and i'm mm-hmm. totally okay that's the biggest one at least I yeah, yeah yeah hey yesterday we were talking uh about christian ronaldo and uh, uh i mentioned it and so it made me because you and i were kind of like speculating on on the whole thing so I, I i went back and like read more into the article so uh, i didn't know this and I, I lebron james did the same thing which i didn't know either until i was reading this article is the one billion dollar deal with nike that's whew, that's lifetime that's so that means one athlete yeah. so that means that. that he has signed with them forever to advertise with them forever. Yeah, yeah. That's basically a Jordan deal right there. So yeah, Jordan, LeBron, and him are the only three that have had something similar to that. Like Jordan didn't do one officially That's like insane. that. insane. Now, what is your thoughts on it, right? Do you think who who's making out in that deal? And do you think that's like a, a well, big Well, I'm risk? sure they ran the numbers. I mean, the numbers, like how does that add up in their favor? Well, Sal was speculating about that yesterday. Now, and we were, or we were both where we're trying to like, well, he's like, what do you think? Like, you know, is he, we were looking at his engagement, like what's a post generate? What do you think, it, what, what do you think that would do? And I was like, Oh, I think it would be this much. And sounds like, do you really think it's that much? And we're going back and forth. Yeah, I wonder if it's, well, I'm sure they're looking at it and saying, okay, we can probably make this much per year from this guy for the next however many years we think he's going to be alive. So guess yeah. who? Guess who is making out like a bandit on that deal? Who? Nike. Nike. What? Nike is making a fucking making wow. out hardcore on that deal. Why? So they, they I read into the. Well, I'm sure they are. Otherwise, well, they wouldn't do it. Of course, right. So the, but big time, not like yeah. kind of making a deal. Last year, Okay, he did 379 posts on Nike for ads, you know, posting. Oh, his social media? Yeah, over the course of the year, whether it be tags, mentions, uh, hashtags, uh, driving to Nike. His post alone over that those 379 posts uh, generated $435 million. No from, from way. posts. Yes. <laughs> that's insane. You know, now you know what's crazy about this? Oh, that's one that's, year. That's yeah. insane to have that kind of power. Now you, just, yeah. You know what's crazy about that is that if these guys, if Ronaldo was more of a business guy, I don't know the guy, right? But if he was more of a business guy. Oh, he'd make his own shoes. He could literally make know, his right? own fucking t shirts. Well, now that's what made Jordan so brilliant, right? That's yeah. what Jordan did. Like Jordan yeah. used that leverage and creates his own. I mean, he's he's he really set the table for all the rest of these athletes or the blueprint. Then Nike had to come buy back into that. Right, yeah. right, right. Wait, I didn't know that. He, he it was I mean, his the, shoe the, brand? Yeah, Jordan Jordan shoe is Jordan shoe. Is a Jordan I thought shoe. they were Nike Jordan. Well, well, they that's how, it, that's how it started. Yeah. It started well, it started with Nike. Started with Nike signing Jordan. And then Jordan and then the contract was over. Yeah, then Jordan branched off and created Jordan shoes. Yeah. So like when you go to like a like a shoe palace or a a, a, a shoe, a oh, popular shoe store. Why didn't I know this? Yeah, you, there's Jordan shoes, and then there's Nikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and our Jordans. Jordans are Jordans, and he makes yes yeah. grip off of those. Yes, wow. Well, well that's yeah. a smart move. It, it's interesting, Nike though, because they're they're also under some heat, I guess, a bit. Because like, so they've been about this whole like uh, the, the campaigns out there. So even the one with Colin Kaepernick, I guess, had made them like a substantial amount of money and all this, but. Their whole initiative this year was to really like pour back to female athletes and like you know like let's let's make this a cause and all this stuff. But like meanwhile, they're getting a bit of criticism because I guess was it Allison uh, uh, Felix? Yeah, Allison Felix, one of the Olympic runners, I guess, uh, had came forward and said that like in terms of maternity and like when she got pregnant and all that, like they 
basically dropped a lot of money and like basically dropped it down to negotiate the 70% less of what she was getting paid, you know, through all this. So wait, wait, hold on. She got pregnant and they said, because you're pregnant, we pay you less. There's no way they could say it that they way. Don't right? They don't say it that way. It. It's just like, yeah, like if, if this, I'm sure it's somewhere in the, in the contract in the clause somewhere where like they have to negotiate mm-hmm. if she's not, you know, visible and doing things and all this, like it's, you know, a num- how, it's how all a feel, numbers game. How do you feel about that? It, well, I, okay. Uh, it's a numbers game if, if if you're making a deal with someone and it is unfair as it may sound you're making a deal with someone that deal is you bring us x amount of dollars we'll pay you x amount of dollars if you're in a, your inability to be on on uh, you know to fulfill your side of the contract then we can re- renegotiate right. so a lot of people say well why are some athletes paid more than others and it's not fair because they generate more more revenue or why are some actors pay more than other actors because their movies generate more revenue they just make more money and believe me company like Nike probably could give a shit. It, you know, it's like, if you make us a lot of money. Unfortunately, they're making it that they do give a shit. That you do give a shit. Like, they're trying to, like, build this perception that they're, right. like, so, so that's all prob- about the, the female athlete oh, that cause, backfires. right? Like, that has to hurt them. Oh, that backfires. Well, that's, so it's all about female athletes. Yeah, if you're and gonna wrap we- yourself in, in the, you know, social justice, like, commentary and, like, make your brand about that, you gotta fucking reflect that. That actually makes a lot of sense. That's why they're getting the heat. That's right. That's why they're getting the yeah. heat is yeah. They, so, because I agree, as a as a as a business operator, it, it it makes logical sense. It's only fair, right? It's like you're, you're you make now, us this much, we pay you this. Yeah, much. and you're you're going to be out now on maternity leave. You're not obviously if you're a track runner, and that's why we signed you because you're a famous right. track runner. You're not sprinting uh, eight months pregnant. But if you're <laughs> all about, you right. know, we're, we're all about supporting women. That looks bad. Yeah, it does that looks bad. really bad. Yeah, Very yeah. interesting. Right. So I want to tell you guys about a study that I read on um, uh, on food labeling or calories labeling calories on foods. So in the past, they've done these tests before where they'll put the total amount of calories on labels or put calories on uh, menus of restaurants in the effort of informing people so that people, because they'll see how many calories certain things have, right. theoretically, they'll make better food choices. Right. You talked about this. Either. Right. Now, we know this has this doesn't work. Right. People look at calories and they think, oh, well, you know, that's only 300 more calories. I'll eat that or whatever. So oftentimes, it actually makes people eat more. And one of the big problems is that people don't know what calories mean. They really don't. They know that calories, you know, mean energy. And if I eat a lot, I'll gain body. But it's still kind of abstract. Okay, okay, 500 calories. Like, what does that mean? 500 more calories. So they're doing studies where they're taking they're taking calories of foods, and then they're putting the equivalent of activity next to it to show you how many what you would have to do to burn that many calories. Right. So you would eat a candy bar, and it would say 300 calories. And then it would say, this is the equivalent of running for six hours or something like that. And what they're finding in these studies is it's Mm. way more effective, way more effective. Now that people can see what those calories actually mean, according Mm. to some of these smaller studies, that they're going to make, that they start to make better choices. Because now, rather than looking at two options and saying, oh, that one's only 300 more calories, they're looking at and saying, wow, that's five hours of of extra movement. That's a lot. Now, doesn't this also feed you know, bad behavior in terms of like, okay, this, this, like, it's a punishment thing, right? Like I, I ate this many calories. Now I have to run this long could right, be. To, to burn it off. Oh yeah. That could definitely be the shadow side. I yeah. But what they found in some of these smaller pilots was that uh, people actually chose more often than when they just had calories, the lower calorie option, because now they know what that means. And it makes sense if yeah. you think about it. Does the average person has no concept so you should read the the Instagram guy from uh, uh, London that I posted that I just shared yesterday. James, whatever that kid, right? That I, I said I like him, and I James, was telling whatever that kid. Yeah, you know. yeah. Well, I just I did the swipe up in my story yesterday, <laughs> and that was his post. He's oh, like, was it? Yeah, I wanted you guys to read that. that so he was kind of he was he was actually using that as a he was using the example of that with like. Uh, you know, buying a, a Louis Vuitton bag and and the amount of money it costs. I, I'll totally massacre the post uh, without reading it, but go on his page and read that. And I thought it was an interesting take on that point. He was mm-hmm. kind of countering it the opposite. Oh no, I could see it going. I could. There's always a shadow side, but yeah. if you think about it as a trainer, one of the ways that you communicate some of these things is you have to put them in terms that the client understands. Correct. Right. right. So calories means nothing to people. It's so abstract. It literally means nothing. But yeah, if you put sense. it, but if you tell somebody, 
And you know what makes it worse is the cardio machines at the gym. The cardio machines at the gym are so oh, off. They're they, so skewed to try and make you think you're making all this progress. Yeah, and they give people this this distorted view of calories. So yeah. I'll tell somebody, they'll be like, oh, I'll just go do an hour of cardio and burn 1,200 calories. I'm like, huh? Who told you to burn 1,200 calories? Oh, the elliptical machine? Yeah, you're not burning 1,200 <laughs> calories. Yeah. You know, you well, could be running from a bear for an hour. Uh, well, I also think there's a big misconception, too, on just how much exercise. Exercise doesn't burn. That's why, that's why resistance training is so more beneficial than any other form of exercise. Yeah, it makes you burn more because, calories on when you're not doing right, it. Right, because when you look at just a one-hour block, a one-hour of CrossFit even, doesn't burn that crazy amount of calories. No. It's you're not talking about thousands of calories. Like you're talking about maybe 500 to 800 calories. And, and if you're kicking ass, that is a I'm a CrossFit. Right, I'm talking yeah. about a fucking intense workout. Is five 800 calories at best. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot. And a kind of a slower paced workout could be 300, three, 350, yeah. yeah, 400 calories. So, I mean, how easy is it to? Get an extra three oh, or four hundred calories. From a soda, in it. you're just yeah, you're right, done. right. It's so easy. That's so one cookie. Yeah, I think I think a lot of times people, you know, and they and then client. I, I always had to communicate this. They would exercise, and you know, in their head, they're like, "Oh, I worked out today, so I can have that dessert, or I can have that." It's, it's like, like, no, you, can't. No, yeah. you, you yeah. worked out today, no, therefore that's you can a losing have, game. You right can have there. a taste of that dessert. Yeah, if right? you want to do it that way. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. that's and that's really what it's like. It's like you. You have one, des your average dessert is probably like 700 to 900 calories. Like your average workout is like 250 to 350. Dude. Like that's, that's, you're, it's crazy. Uh, unless you go to the Cheesecake Factory. Have you seen their Dude. slices of cheesecake? Oh, yeah. yeah. 1,500. Like, oh, 2,000 calories. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 1,500 it's calories. It's like a fucking Their salads are about that much too. Yeah. No, but that's why I think this may be interesting because uh, rather than telling people to go work, and I see what you're saying, Justin, but. Maybe it'll help teach, and this is me with my eternal faith in people, right? Yeah, right. Maybe this will teach them or, or give them the opportunity to really understand how hard it is to burn calories and how easy it is to consume mm. them. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway, I, had a, I was having a great discussion uh, yesterday with someone through my DMs. They were uh, asking questions about, you know, how do I know if, if this diet's working for me and whatever. And something popped up that I used to communicate quite a bit um, when I was a trainer that I don't think I've ever talked about on the show. But I think, which I think is valuable, I think every person kind of has uh, a, a, a one of their body's louder signals that tends to be unique to them that is their their own unique signal that tells them when things are going good or going bad. For example, you know, Adam, you talk a lot about uh, your psoriasis. That's your signal. That's your loudest signal, right? That's yeah. the one that's most my obvious. loudest is gas. <laughs> yes. yeah. Super loud. I'm very loud. Uh, for me, it's my gut health. I can. That's the first signal that will. You know, that's the first bell that gets rung that tells me something. Something is off. For other people, it may be their skin. Could be headaches. Headaches. Could be sleep. Could be energy. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it's a great place to start. You know, you don't have to become this wizard of learning every single sign that your body gives you. Focus on the one big signal that you have. Do you have a tendency towards digestive issues? Does your skin tend to break out? Do you tend to uh, find yourself getting irritable or foggy? Some people get foggy-minded, and that's their big signal. And your big signal is the one that tends to pop up the most, mm -hmm. and that seems to be the loudest, and the thing that seems to interrupt uh, your quality of life uh, the fastest. Watch that signal, because if that signal pops up first... Because for me, it's my gut health, and if I ignore that, then other stuff starts to follow. Right. Um, so it's just a, it was a good tip. I used to, I remember teaching that to clients, and it makes it a lot easier than than telling somebody, you know, listen to your whole body. Well, it's, right. it, it, it's like my toe hurts. What it's the mean? first step towards uh, intuitive eating. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to get to a place where you're no longer having to weigh, measure, track everything that you consume. One of the best places to, to uh, start to get there is to start paying attention. And, and it's funny because I what I've found with clients is most of them kind of know. Mm. It's the, you, but you just kind of it's kind of like what I talked about the other day where you know when I was putting uh, when I started to put on a lot of body fat and I was falling out of shape. It's like it wasn't like if someone actually questioned me like, "Hey Adam, are you in good shape right now?" I, yeah, I, I'm not in good shape right now. Mm. But I ignore the mirror. I ignore lights on when I'm naked. I, you do all these things to like try and be naive to it but you really know i feel clients a lot of times we're the same way it's like they knew if they had psoriasis oh. they knew if they had gas issues they knew mm -hmm. if they got bloated they knew if they had headaches from something it's just that they choose to kind of like ignore o it oftentimes yeah. the big signal or the main signal of your body which can be different from person to person oftentimes it's the signal that you medicate the most mm -hmm. so if you're somebody that is like you you eat tums constantly you know after every meal 
I have Tums or, oh, I got to take, uh, you Always know. Always hammering me. I gotta, <laughs> or, you know, I have to. <laughs> that goes right to home yeah, right here. <laughs> or I take this allergy medicine because I, I you know, I, I'll, I'll get sinus issues or, right. or, oh, yeah, I take ibuprofen, you know, three times a week because I have headaches all the time. Right. Yeah. You know, that tends to be your main signal. Like, what are you always treating? You know what I mean? No, Pay it's attention true. To that thing. It's true. I used to get headaches all the time, and I'm like, what is going on in my body? Like, I, I had no idea. Like, I was, I just figured out that, like, you know, like, I would look at, at the shelf. I keep buying ibuprofen. I keep buying Excedrin, and, like, I was trying to cope with this pain that was just part of my life. And, and I was like, this isn't right. And that led me down to find out, like, I had, I had like, a tumor. My, my blood pressure was off. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All this crazy shit. But, like, your body screams at you for yeah. A reason. It was, well, you, it was benign, by the way. It was benign. You, <laughs> yeah, you, you talk about like the my psoriasis, and it's a great when I, when my diet is dialed, and I'm doing the things like the juve light, or I'm getting out in sun. Like literally, I don't have to put my creams and stuff all over it to mm -hmm. keep it from flaring up. But if any of that stuff is off, if I'm not getting enough sunlight or vitamin D, if I, my diet is whack, it's the first thing to start to flare up. And I either one could take that as information and feedback for myself. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I need to get better about these things or slap on the cream and be rubbing the cream like crazy. And, and the reason why your main signal may be one of the most difficult ones to pay attention to mm. is because you've probably had it for a long time right. and you've probably done this. Oh, that's just how I am. Like, yeah. oh, 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 headaches? Yeah, I've had headaches. First. Yeah. I just get headaches. Yeah. And you just, it becomes a part of like who you are and it's not something you even pay attention to anymore. You've ex You've accepted it past the point of, trying to figure out maybe what the root cause is, you know, like, yeah. oh, oh, gut issues. Yeah. Gut I'm issues. pretty sure that's the norm, you know, yeah. for, for your average person is just, they, they come to conclude like, this is the way I am. And this is, you know, my genetics gave me, you know, like, this is just how things are. And like, this is how I have to cope with it, mm. but you can change that. Yeah. It's interesting. Like, like talking about like feedback, uh, did you guys see too, that, uh, LSU is, is one of the leading, um, like universities out there for their sports programs. They're including a lot of like, like big data, uh, you know, coming in to test their athletes like during their training. And it's been like doing wonders for them in terms of like being able to monitor, track progress and actually see those results translate now onto the field. So, you know, wow. much like um, and this is the thing where it's like we don't want to get all like obsessed with like technology and having it like interrupt what they're doing. This is more of like we're just going to turn it on and we're going to evaluate, you know, like what's working, what's not working working by watching the speed by watching the strength increases and all this like like automatically by having these sensors there well, well this is an example like we talked about the other day of where i see value in these tools and why they're amazing is for mm -hmm. things like that. remember when we had Corey? like uh and, you know i'm yes. a big sports guy I watch a lot of sports and and, and up and up on uh, for the most part like what they're doing and what teams are using the latest and greatest technology but boy he he uh you know he definitely shines some light on the, the methodologies that they were using at, at Stanford that yeah. I didn't know they were they were doing things at that level which I thought was fascinating. Oh, my mind was blown. I went up there and he showed me like their their whole system and how they like would wear monitors to show stress and so he he, he like could pull up each individual athlete and see records of like oh he even could, the weekends how, how much yeah how much activity they had to the how much steps they monitored like they have a GPS on them so they could see yeah. how much they're moving around and. You know, if he, if his sleep has been off for two or three days, and so he would modify his their, li their lifting, and then he would communicate to the the basketball coach, yeah. hey, you know, let's go a little lighter yeah, on practice yeah, today. Take it easy on Justin today, because Justin, this, this, and this has been going yeah. on. He's been moving, but hey, get after Sal because Sal's fully rested. He's good. He's strong right now. He's at his peak. Like, get him. You know, that's man. We weren't doing that at just some, a decade no. ago. I wonder if at some point they're going to be so dialed in where your food is going to be perfect like oh looks like this is what you should be eating today and, i think so. hey hey uh, uh adam actually why don't you take a nap right now you know or yeah you know tomorrow you're only going to sleep for five hours home we need yeah. to stress your body i 100 percent believe we're going to see that with athletes soon too i don't yeah. think so we're cool. i don't think we're far off from i mean the no, there's so much money in sports of course you know it's like a formula one car you know how much oh. money and technology is in a Formula One car? It makes yeah. money. Well, I saw this too. Even with the Warriors, were experimenting with a lot of these like uh, devices and things. And one of the best things was like they they found all these tendencies. So like using this big data, you could find who should be where on the court at what play. You yeah. know, and like who should get the ball in that situation, and you know who has the best uh, likelihood of of scoring. And it's it's, it's crazy. Now talking about like lots of money, did you guys hear that Disney may be the first movie studio 
to cross the $10 billion mark in a year. Whew. $10 billion globally. So Frozen 2 is, is close to earning a billion dollars. And that's going to help bring them to $10 billion, which breaks their previous record that they set in 2016 of $7.6 billion. And they still got the last Star Wars here coming in uh, the 20th. And they're slotted. The article I read like maybe, I don't know, three months ago or so on the show, uh, I think they're slotted for like 43 different Marvel-type releases from streaming uh, series to movies. Disney is a buy. It's got to be, and even though expensive, such powerhouse. A, oh my! I mean, ten billion dollars, and the previous record was their own, and they're breaking their own record by three billion dollars. I know that's I'm, insane. I, I, you know what? Remember, like Netflix was on the scene for a long time before it got super popular. It's not like Netflix just one day popped up as a streaming service right. and they were the best. Like they were, they're grinding away at it a long time to get to the point now where they released the, the quality of content they are releasing now. Look the fuck out, bro. Disney is just now like really get d- dabbling in the streaming service world, and I, I feel like it's going going to get that much better once they start getting their own analytics on yeah. what is our audience mm-hmm. loving, what are, what are most they, people. What I mean, they're they're Disney's brilliant with their writing is brilliant, and then the characters that they pick and put in their movies mm-hmm. is just it's it's hands down nobody can compete. Look, you watch the Mandalorian, right? Mm-hmm. It's great, great fun to watch or whatever. Who would have thought that they would have had a little baby Yoda become a worldwide meme explosion oh, yeah. success? My People my daughter could give a shit about Star Wars, loves it because baby Yoda. Yeah. You know how much merchandise they're going to sell now, of that now, little guy? Now, what I, I, I believe that there, there's so much brilliance and they have the best of the best of that they foresaw that. Like I wouldn't. Oh, be of so, course, that was part of the plan. right. Like that's where they're so good at is doing things like that and creating stuff like Frozen that ends up being shareable and and fall in love with. Like I mean, it's it's a formula and they have definitely mastered it. I think better than anybody. And so it's it's fun to watch them. I know we have some fans that hate us. Talk. We talk so much about Disney. I <laughs> think we work for them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we're trying to work. Maybe, for them. Yeah. Come on, yeah, Disney. Yeah, yeah. Pick us up. Yeah. yeah right. Mind pump. Right. Yeah. We're not quite uh, family friendly. <laughs> First question is from Dress Fit. What are some good compound exercises for adductors and abductors? I, I like this question because because um, you picked it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Mainly that. That's actually the only reason why I, I have no idea how to answer Knew this. It. <laughs> uh, no, because uh, I, I think we've t- talked about this on the show uh, when people have asked us, you know, funny questions like, you know, what's the, the least effective machine in the entire gym? In fact, I remember way back in the day when we used to hang out with Craig when he was here in California still. Um, uh, I used to razz him about using that machine. And the reason being is... The adductor machine? Yeah. And, and to me, this is where you, you can do some cool things with like step-ups to stabilization and doing movements that have got... Uh, carry over and you get some of the benefits of working the abductors and adductors. So yeah, those don't target them directly like an isolation exercise, like the good girl, bad girl machines, but the benefits that a client gets from a step up by mm. itself and then teaching them how to uh, pay attention and focus. Cause the, the typical person that doesn't understand uh, mechanics at all and just steps up, it's very natural for people to their knee to cave in or, and their the foot to kind of pronate. So teaching them to, to have, have a, a good base with their feet, to keep their knee open and step up to a balance, uh, you get a lot of good stabilization there. You do. Yeah, the, the adductors are muscles on the inside of the thighs. They bring the legs together. The abductors are muscles on the outside of the thighs, right? They bring the legs <clears throat> apart. So the machine that Adam's referring to, that you know, that's – Commonly referred to. Good girl, bad girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, no machine or whatever is the one that you lay, you sit down, you open, you close your legs or whatever. Yeah. But you can do compound movements where you're using more weight in your, and th- those tend to be very effective at developing these muscles. One of my favorites for the inner thigh, the adductors, is a, a good old fashioned, uh, you know, sumo type exercises, exercises with a wide stance mm-hmm. uh, where you're squatting up and these muscles are really having to stabilize really hard. Uh, to maintain that position. So like a sumo squat uh, would be a good example. The funny thing too is your intention can change a sumo squat from a Adductor to an abductor exercise. So right? well, I just love everything in the in the frontal plane. So if I want to take, uh, you know, side lunges are, are great Cossack for that as squats. well, or Cossack squats. So you know, just just getting that 
added piece of, of functional movement that you're not, you know, normally going to apply in your programming is, is already a big advantage. So to, to make that more of a, uh, you know, full body inclusive workout, that would be great. Yeah, and there's really cool ways to do uh, a standard conventional squat with tools. So, uh, you know, you could, this is where, and I have a video, I think I'm, I'm doing real soon here for the YouTube channel. Uh, like using hip circles. Mm -hmm. And this is where you see a lot of people using them. So you use the hip circle and as you're as you're dropping down in this in a great squat, which we all know is a great compound lift, you're pushing and forcing your knees out. You can also do uh, the uh, opposite of that by putting like a basketball between your legs mm -hmm. and squeezing the basketball as you go into a squat. So th those are two ways that you can use a tool to accomplish targeting an area that you want to put emphasis on. Which is also a great, you know, uh, way, uh, like a teachable way to to help somebody with compensations. So right. Like, yeah, so that would be a good way to address issues where you notice, you know, your knees come out too excessively in a squat. Uh, you know, you place a basketball there, you have them like focus intentionally on squeezing in yeah. as a squat. Yes, I'm glad you said that because uh, when you're working on compensations, I've actually seen this more – too, too many times. That's why I want to clarify. A compensation, when you're, when you're trying to work on a compensation, you want to strengthen the opposing movement, okay? Not prevent the movement from happening. There's a difference there. Mm -hmm. uh, like I would have, I've seen this way too many times. A trainer will put, uh, you know, a, a medicine ball or something between someone's knees when they do a squat to squeeze it. And then I would ask them, well, why are you doing that? I was like, oh, their knees cave in. Yeah, that's the worst idea. The ca knees cave in, so it prevents the knees from caving in. I'm like, all you're doing is making them squeeze you're their legs in. You're reinforcing the problem. Yeah, yeah, so when that person, if the knees cave in, you put something around the legs so they push out. Something in between the legs is if their knees go out when they squat. And really, this is what you really want to pay attention to when it comes to the adductors and abductors. They're small muscles. Like mm -hmm. Really isolating them or developing isn't really a big deal unless you see an imbalance in your movement, in which case... Here's where the imbalances come from with the adductors and abductors. Uh, avoidance of lateral exercise. Really, this is what it, what it boils down to. Are you doing exercises that make you step out mm -hmm. to the side or walk to the side? I love the sled for this. You, you, you attach the sled around your waist, walk sideways by crossing your legs over like a karaoke, mm -hmm. and you're going to get great. You can either make it work the abductors uh, of the leg that's pushing out or the adductor of the leg that's pulling you forward as you walk across. In my opinion, that is the one of the best things you could possibly do for those two muscles. Well, sideways walking with different variations. It's also well. great, you know, uh, this is where we talked about um, pre-exhausting these areas. So, uh, yes, there's compound movements that you can do that help target or uh, put emphasis on these, these two muscles. But, you know, a lot of times what I would do is, uh, you know, going back to Justin's point is if I have a client where their, their knees are caving in, then I'm going to do lateral two blocks first, and then I'm going to squat. And when I'm squatting, I'm cueing, you know, don't let your knees cave in, push your knees mm -hmm, out at the bottom mm -hmm. of the squat. Um, and I, they're going to, they're going to be better engaged with that muscle because I just had them do an isolation exercise with it first. So, you know, understanding why you're doing it. I think a lot of people try and target these muscles because they think it's going to make their their thighs look shapely or they're like, oh, I want to I want to work on my inner thighs, you know, because I don't like my inner thighs. And so they think like doing a, a machine like this or doing exercises like this is going to really benefit that. And that's where, you know, I'm not a fan of those machines. There's other uh, movements that you can incorporate those muscles. Uh, here's one. If you are going to do machine, I like, uh, man, and you've heard me talk about this on the show is a uh, single leg press. I'll never do a leg press with both feet. Just uh, to me, it's uh, for me, it's a waste of time. It's not that beneficial in my opinion for, for both legs to be planted on there. It's already, you're already very stable anyways. And throwing one leg up there does force you to really engage both of these muscles to keep the knee from stable. Cause that's what they, they're responsible for. They're going to keep that knee stable. And so you got to think about that. So as you drop down on the sled, you're trying to keep that knee in line with the toe, and I'll tell you what, you the inner and outer thighs will be sore as shit when you do a single leg press. Next question is from Earth Tonina. I've been lifting with no belts or straps. As I increase my weight, should I start to use these devices or continue without? Yeah, no, you don't need to. Now, no. now here's the thing. You can use them if you want to and if you use them properly, but should you? No. I mean... The only people that I think should use a belt are people who are training to compete with a belt. Mm -hmm. So if you're a power lifter or a strongman competitor and your competition 
allows you to use a belt. It's important to train with a yeah. belt to learn how to use one. It's basically part of the uniform if you look at it that way. Like, yes. Like this is these are the rules. You know, other people are going to be using them. You you want to know how to use these tools to your advantage, so you need to incorporate them in your training. Right. So a belt, basically, what a belt does is it goes around the waist. Uh, they're very wide and stiff and thick, at least the good ones. And what they do is they increase uh, core stability. And the way they work is you as you're wearing one, it's really tight. Your abs and your core pushes out against it. It creates more stability. That stability then allows you to lift more weight because your, your spine is more stable. So squatting and deadlifting with a belt, if you use it properly, you should be able to use more weight. But make no mistake, you're relying on the belt because without the belt, you wouldn't be able to lift uh, that way. Now, straps are the things that go around your wrists, and there's a strap that hangs down from your hand that you wrap around the bar that gives you a stronger grip, or at least it grips the bar essentially for you. And for many people, their grip is the weak link. That's what prevents them from pulling max weight or whatever. Mm -hmm. There may be some benefit for high volume trainers, bodybuilders. Uh, and of course, if you're a strong man, oftentimes they allow you to use straps. But for most people, there's no value. I mean, you'll see me use a belt when I deadlift really heavy. And to be quite honest, it's because I've done it for so long with a belt that heavy mm -hmm. that I really don't feel like going through the whole process of lifting, you know, with deadlifting without a belt. Now, I do go through cycles of not using a belt, um, but most of the time, if I go above four or 500 pounds, well, and, the wear a belt. and the truth is, part of that is uh, us. The psychological piece. I mean, I want to pull 500 something pounds off the ground. I know that with a belt, I get an extra 20 to 30, 30 pounds. And it still now, counts on Instagram. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It counts on Instagram. Uh, if you're the, if you're a client, I'm, I've never, I've never recommended a belt, a strap, a sleeve, uh, uh, any of these tools, uh, squat shoes. None of those things uh, do I recommend, especially if somebody has been lifting without any of them. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean that I don't I think they're all of those tools are in my bag and I use them all the time. But it's also it's uh it's I look at it as something that um I like playing around with. Uh, I never want to become dependent on any of those things. Like and those things you can become dependent on. If you are somebody who always wear a weight belt and you get used to that feeling of having a belt for you to push your core against, which is different than when you don't have a belt. That's important to understand that. Like when you lift normally and you brace your core, you brace inward and you hold like a vacuum around your spine and you teach your body to do that, to support yourself. If you use a belt, you're using the, the belt as feedback and then your core is pushing out against the belt to create stability. Yeah, and what happens when your core pushes out when you don't have a belt? Exactly. Yeah. You lose stability. Lose it. It, yeah. So you don't want to be, you don't want to use these things so much that, and then also with the straps, I mean, there's, there's times in bodybuilding I absolutely use. I use my straps a lot more uh, in bodybuilding than I did today, and that would be because I didn't want my forearms and my grip strength to fatigue when I was focusing on a certain muscle group. I'm trying to develop one area. I don't want any other areas to get more developed at all. I'm focusing somewhere, so I wouldn't want them to be fatigued on a day. I get that from a bipolar perspective, especially if you're trying to get a good lap pump. And, and like a lot of times, the first thing to fatigue, what is it? It's your grip, you yeah. know, and like your forearms are just like beach balls at that point to where you didn't even get that, you know, the most out of what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. But, you know, for me, and I, I, I probably sound like the purest in the group, but it's just how I've always trained. I've always trained. Like if I, if I can't pick it up with just, you know, what I have, like, I don't, like I didn't earn it. Like, and, and I've just carried that into my squats. I've carried that into deadlifts. Although I do like, I do the whole adjustable grip thing, you know, alternate my grips and try different things to like, you know, gain more stability that way, which, you know, there's different techniques, you know, to kind of get around some of these things. But uh, I just don't want to be dependent on any of these aids, um, you know, to, to kind of take me to the next level. Whereas, yeah. you know, some people that's really important to them. So yeah. I, I don't, I don't like look down on people for not doing that. That's just like my own mentality. The one that, you know, that is, that is pretty cool is the, is the straps. And what I mean by that is your, your capability to hold on to the weight that your body can lift is actually pretty damn good. I mean, we did evolve from primates, um, and our hands have a tremendous capacity for strength. I lifted for years with wrist straps, for years. And then when I, I went off the wrist straps, and it took me a couple years 
for my grip to get up to the point where it could handle what I could lift to the point now where there's nothing I can't, if I can lift it, I can grip it. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if I use a hook grip or I use an alternate grip, um, you know, those types of techniques. So your hands have tremendous c capability for strength. And I really think it's important that we don't, you know, that we allow our hands to get really, really strong because your hands are what connect you to the entire world. Everything from using a pen to anytime you grab something. Uh, but yeah, with belts, uh, I've only used belts twice with clients. There's only two clients I've ever used belts with, and that Doug was one of them. And that's just because it was fun. You know, Doug was got strong. Well, and that's my it point. It's an it's a ego mm -hmm. lift. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very aware of that. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know even when I've I've done posts on uh, Instagram where I'm squatting or I'm deadlifting and you see the belt on me, like that belt came on for that lift because I knew I was pushing my max load. I knew that I'm probably going to lift a weight that is getting close to probably PR range. I'm going to wear a belt for safety reasons and I'm going to push that. Is it super beneficial for me gaining, gaining strength or building muscle in the overall journey? Not at all. Yeah. No, it's it's... So I, if you're not, if you're somebody who's been lifting and you, you're not using any of these tools, like, oh, you're stay pure, stay in the purest. Like, uh, yeah, because uh, once you learn how to use these and you get used to them, yeah, going back takes time. That's mm -hmm. half the that's hard, half the struggle that I deal with is that I like you, I used a belt and straps and all these tools my entire career, and I can feel it's still a difference. I've gotten so good at using those tools that I'm weaker. I'm weaker without them. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm weaker on my squat. I'm weaker on my deadlift. I can most certainly strapped up, belted up. I can definitely deadlift more weight and squat more weight than if I was without them. Next question is from Brandon LPZ26. What should kids' nutrition look like? Should I worry about giving my children more protein, healthy fats, and vegetables instead of focusing on carbs, as the food pyramid suggests? So it's not that... It's not so black and white. And what I mean by that, the best uh, studies that we have on what's healthy nutrition um, are these really big cultural studies because most a lot of nutrition studies are done uh, by survey, uh, very few really controlled studies. So it's kind of difficult to tell you know, what's doing what or whatever. But there are some general things that we've kind of teased out. One of them is overeating is probably not a good idea regardless mm -hmm. of what you're eating. Um, from a trainer standpoint, I think creating good behaviors around food is really important. And a lot of what your kids learn behaviorize around food are from observing you or from the way you and your, your spouse or you and their other parent or other you know, uh, parental figure uh, eat foods. As far as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are concerned, you can go look. You can go to some very healthy cultures. You, go, you can watch some Japanese cultures that are very, very healthy, and they're, they're relatively carb dominant. There's a lot of rice and a lot of starchy vegetables and a lot of vegetables and fish and not a whole lot of meat. And you can go to other cultures that are more paleo with the way that they feed their children that are very healthy. Now, one thing that all these cultures have in, combi that have in common is they don't overeat and they also don't eat a lot of heavily processed foods. I, and I think that's the real... Uh, it I guess this one's different for me, right? Because my kid's not here at, at this point, although we were about to start introducing food. Um, and I think the way I would look at it um, is exactly that. The, the biggest concern that I have with his, his diet in the future is other people giving him things that are, are less ideal, like you know candy and sweets and ice cream and, and stuff that is for sure less beneficial than whole foods, right? So that... and. That to me is what I'm more concerned about. And so, and I think I would like pay attention to the way he's eating. If I, I know, I think the boys both do this. It's something that I, I would for sure do is I, I would start their, their plates with the, like the vegetables and the, and the greens and get those things, get them eating those things first. And then I would work my way to the protein. And then eventually I'd work my way to the carbohydrates. So I'd kind of serve dinner. I plan to serve dinner like that. Now I have no idea how that's going to go down. Like maybe it's mm -hmm. going to be a nightmare for me and uh, it's not going to work. And at the end of the day, uh, as I'm going to be paying attention, is, is he getting, uh, did he go a day, two days with no protein? Okay. Well then tomorrow I make sure that that's definitely a priority in the way we eat or did I notice that he had processed food in his diet? I'm going to make sure that the next day he has none of that shit in there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm going to be paying attention like that. I'm I'm not going to be counting his macros no. and in making sure that he's every meal has got a a, a 20 percent ratio of protein, a 30. You know, what I'm saying I'm not doing it's that. It's tough because I mean there is that like, am I going to give my kid a complex like way too early? You know about 
uh, you know, all these different parameters they have to fit in. And, uh, you know, for me, it's it's different. It's different. And everybody's family is different. Everybody's kids are different. Uh, but there are some of those things, like you mentioned, with like trying to avoid, you know, heavily processed foods. Like, I, I just think in terms of that being like one goal, that's a big goal. That, right. Cause True. Because you, you have you boxed buy them. juice. You have bought, like, yeah. So, and that's the thing, too, is like, you know, they are going to go out. They are going to be at a friend's house. They are going to, like, you know, it depends on if you want to be that rigid about like what uh, that looks like in your family. But for me, I like to make like I like to educate, and we we've talked about this about like why it's good to rotate nutrients and like get introduce you know different types of these foods into their diet and like what kind of health you know that promotes and like it boosts your immune system. This one gives you energy. Like this helps your muscles grow. Like you know very simple things. Uh, you know where it's like more like I'm I like I want them to want to get this because they're they're starting to move more to work out more and they want to benefit their body because you know those foods provide that yeah i think you know overall just it's okay to relax a little bit um right. you know because you know what happens when you have fitness fanatics who have kids uh sometimes it goes too far it's too rigid yeah and then you create some problems they'll 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 rebound and go in the opposite direction and have a bad experience with food because i look i have cousins like this i have cousins who's my, my uncle was a Super into nutrition. He's a Chinese herbalist, and his kids ate nothing that was not healthy. They didn't buy anything that wasn't healthy, but it was so rigid and strict. The second they came out of the house, they all, you know, they went crazy with their with their food and the nutrition. And yeah. you you, you got to be okay, be a little loose. Remember, these kids live in the real world. Um, and at the end of the day, really, what the most important thing is is the environment of the house. They're going to watch you. They're going to see how you yeah, eat. One hundred percent. To me, that's, that's the, the biggest factor. The biggest thing that I've had to coach to this point is with parents. And it's like, if you if you're the type of parent that you know makes your breakfast, makes your dinner, makes your lunch at home, and you use you know, mostly whole foods to get that done. And the kids see you eat that, you eat that with you. You're doing better than 90% of the Right, uh, and that's such there. a, because they're, 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 it's inevitable, right? And I, I, I have to make peace with this already because I know this is going to be one of my challenges. Yeah. So I'm aware that they're going to make their way over, you know, to the uncle's house or my or my grandmother, the gra their grandmother's house one time, and they're going to sneak them a popsicle or give them an Oreo. And there's or you may find that, you know, you're, like with my kids, like the, if, if my daughter is like, I don't want to eat anything that, you, you know, no eggs or whatever. Like, okay, we'll have a little bit of cereal. I'll pick the right cereal, have some whole milk with it. It's not that big of a deal if you do that. You know, here and there, yeah. and it's it's not a big deal, and it you just kind of be okay a little bit with that because you're going too far in the other direction. Yeah. Uh, because here's kids will fucking I swear to God, it, it, th this is the biggest battle that parents have with kids by far. You ask any parent, it's, it's meal time. That's the hardest, oh, yeah. hardest struggle. It's it's the biggest stressor you're gonna find like as the kids you know grow up, and that's why it is like you have to be kind of like strategic about how you're gonna handle it like because it happens every single night. It's either like a, a serious battle or it's like you know like like I'm just gonna kind of let this one go. Now to that point though, Justin, you I think you shared with me uh, this was before I had Max and I was just kind of uh, asking you dad questions like. You know, where I, I think the question I asked you one night when we we're, I think we were in Sacramento or something, and I said, uh, you know, is there something that you did really good with your firstborn that mm. you didn't do with your second? Mm -hmm. And can you tell the difference in their behaviors? And you shared with me that the, the way you were eating wise and, the, and you noticed patterns mm -hmm. now that they're older. What was that? So the first, I mean, we were very, uh, I think that, that we put a lot of effort and attention into. Um, you know, like the sourcing and the quality of the food that we would like freeze ahead of time and have it all like pre prepped. So we would be able to like blend these things and introduce, you know, certain things one at a time. And uh, we, we did a lot better job of the diversity of the nutrients we expose our first kid to, to where he like it. I don't know, like, you know, this is like, again, one of those things, like anecdotal wise, like, I don't know if that was be, like why he's more of an adventurous eater and will try things, you know, or if it's just a personality thing where my youngest, like, so we didn't, uh, unfortunately, you know, like the, there was just less, way busier with less <laughs> attention. You're busy. You got all these things. All of a sudden, you know, you're accounting for like a lot more in your house and uh, you know, it, it did happen. It just didn't happen as frequently and we weren't as intentional from the very beginning. And that's why I think that there might have been, a, you know, a missed opportunity on some level uh, to where it's been 
much more of a battle with my youngest uh, in terms of like getting him to, to span out of like the two or three things he'll even eat. Mm. So, uh, but it, he's coming around. And I think that, uh, again, like it, it, it's stressful as a parent because you Dude, feel like you're failing or like, you know, especially it, if you're in the health It's business. one of the number one things. Yeah. You, you talk to any parent, what's your number one stress with your child, especially before they're teenagers. Once they're teenagers, they start to make choices and you're like, whatever. But uh, it's it's feeding time. It's one of the most difficult, absolute difficult things. And it's like, do you want to have a war well, I also every time? Because that's not healthy. I, you know I, I, mean? I also think that's why a lot of them fold, though. I think that's why a lot of them fold and say, fuck it, we're going to McDonald's. Right. You know, or fuck Sometimes it, go, that's wait, throw, way throw, easier. throw the frozen burrito in there here. And yeah. you know what? Here's the thing. Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes it's okay. Because, again, at the end of the day, this kid is going to live in the real world. Do you think they're not going to fucking drive by a McDonald's right. when they're older? You know what will end up happening? It's like, again, it's like those kids that are so so strict the second they get they out. They rebel. They rebel. It's, yeah. like this, it's like the hyper-Christian family whose kid grows up and is like, I'm going to you know, I'm gonna be a Satanist yeah. or whatever. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit, what happened? That happens, dude. Totally. Yeah. No, I think that's just it. You just can't be extreme about it. But And again, in my non-experience of raising a child, but all the experience I had with clients who had children and talking, having this discussion a lot, the ones that had the most success were the ones that just led from the front. That they they lived a healthy life. Totally. Mom and dad looked fit. They ate well. Everybody they had energy. Together. Yeah, they ate together. Like those were the ones that 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 never seemed to have this the same type of struggles. Not to say that they don't all have struggle and they and, and that time's not stressful like Justin and Sauer both saying, but those those families that I, I was coaching, those ones had the easier time. It was the family that, you know, mom and dad both worked. They mm -hmm. they rarely ever sat at the dinner table together. You know, maybe they they picked they got to eat at work because they worked at a place like Google where they could eat there. Then they came home, and then when they came home, whatever it was fast and easy. They made the kids, or they could throw from a box. Like, you know, you you do that, and then you and then you see your kids start to put on weight, and then you get all nervous, like, oh shit, well, he's getting this is getting out of control. Yeah, and I'm you putting my kid, back, on, yeah. I'm putting my kid on a diet, and they're gonna eat differently than the rest of the family. Yeah, that that's not gonna it's cost not gonna something. work. Yeah, back to the the processed food point though. Like I I have noticed like and why that this is something that you you definitely want to kind of consider is that like i've noticed them they'll, they'll eat a lot more calories if that's like included it's hyper palatable yeah so just like we i mean we talk about this a lot but you visibly see it like with your kids if they're eating like more of the boxed stuff and like the the, the chips and the crackers and all this they're 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 not as good at self-regulating so like if not you kind of leave them to you know, to themselves, they know how much they should like feed themselves. You're giving them kind of more whole foods. Like it, it's this natural like mechanism. It, it, they stop when they should stop. So it, it is, it's, it's one of those things. Like calories is a thing that, you know, you want to let them sort of, you know, regulate. Next question is from Cam J Lyons. If you guys took over an average population gym, what are the common problems you would look for to change first? What issues with personnel or equipment would be at the top of your list to fix? Oh, this is great. I know. So, this, this is a fun one for us. Yeah. So, Sal has this dream that one day Mind Pump will actually do this. Oh, yeah. This I think is that, like his ultimate dream. I think it would be so fun. <laughs> it would be so fun for us to go in like a restaurant. What do they call it? Restaurant rescue or rescue restaurant? Like those, rest those uh, uh, bar rescue. Bar, yeah, yeah. Where you go in and you turn around a, a you know, failing business or whatever, I would love to walk into a gym and do that for like a month or whatever. Everything's half off! Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I literally think that we probably would all start, I would, I'm would, i guessing, um, in the same place, which is the personnel side, um, because we used to have a saying. That's in, the culture. Yeah, yeah, in the industry that there's, there's no such thing as uh, bad clubs, just bad leaders or bad managers. And so the, the, the personnel and the culture and the people that run the facility really do make the facility. So, yeah. and uh, people that I would advise in this used to hate to hear this from me. And most people will be scared to do this. So I'm going to say it. And someone's probably needs to hear this, but you're still probably going to be too scared to do it. But I'm telling you right now, you have to, is go in and clean house. And man, that is so hard for people to do. They just, they, they're scared. I'm going to have to get rid of all these people and start over. Like, what am I going to do? It's going to put so much stress on me. But the reality of it is whoever had a hold of that facility before I got there ran things the way they ran things. And if we are going to completely recreate a culture uh, and around the philosophies that I believe that make a successful gym, that I need my people. 
I need the people that since day one I've onboarded them and I have I have taught them how to do things and I've coached and developed them up. Uh, if I do that, I might go through the growing pains of three to six months of the firing and rehiring and the training and developing. But after that six month time, boy, the job gets way easier versus what I had done in earlier parts of my career, which was the opposite, which was come into a new place and try and change the way everybody did things. And they were already used to the guy or the girl that was running the place before that boy, was that a battle? So I for sure would start there and start to build my team first. Yeah, the, the two the two people in the gym, the two uh, employees or category of employees that actually, believe it or not, have the biggest impact on the culture of your club are your front desk staff and your trainers. Those are the two people that tend to have the biggest control of the culture uh, in your club. So those are the first places that I look. So when I would take over a club, I would go in and I'd hang out with the front desk on the first day. Uh, with every single person that showed up, I'd stay at that front desk. I'd meet members and I'd, you know, hang out with that front desk person and, and, and start to develop a good relationship with them. I would, of course, start. I would I would schedule a big all staff meeting and I'd set up my expectations for everybody. Um, and then I'd spend a lot of time training and developing my trainers because the trainers were the ones on the workout floor. They're the ones everybody sees. That's training. They're the ones responsible for maintain making sure that the dumbbells are off the floor and that the you know, they're out there all the time. Now, the salespeople, the salespeople oftentimes uh, you would have to, I would have to at least fire because salespeople either want to be there and make it happen uh, or they don't. Um, and oftentimes that would, I would definitely have to get rid of those people. But, you know, it, it's always crazy to me. And I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, I learned this from uh, one of my mentors years ago. Um, when you walk into a club, you can almost tell almost to like a, a 100% accuracy, the culture of the club by the front desk. Mm -hmm. You walk in, yeah. and that front desk person, the way they check you in, the way they talk to you, the way the energy is up there, that tends to be a reflection of the rest of the club. And to a member, it kind of is. That's the gatekeeper of the facility. But I can't stress this enough. You know, Adam made the point that it's all about the person outlook. I've run clubs that were old as fuck. I mean, shitholes. <laughs> yeah, I've run clubs that were... They Pools used to, were swamps. They used to be flagships, uh, you know, locations, but they'd been around for 20 years and the ceiling would fall when it would rain and I got a pool <laughs> that doesn't work half the time. This is a true story. The heater's on during the I, summer. I yeah. ran I ran 24 Fitness Sunnyvale, so for you, you guys at 24, Club 506, when I took it over, this is before they redid the club, this is one of the older clubs. They still had a racquetball. Okay, so racquetball, by this point, nobody was doing it anymore. We had racquetball courts. And the pool was broken, I don't know, 50% of the time. We'd have to put cones around it. Uh, when it rained, the, the ceiling in, the, in my operations manager office would fall. <laughs> my weights didn't match. I had some plates that were one way and other plates that were another way. The equipment, it was one of the old school clubs where they separate everything. So like free weights in this closed off room and machines over here and cardio, which that's a terrible layout. We know that now in gyms. You want everything to be open. And you know that club had a massive goal because – some of the best managers in the company had gone through that club. These people at that point were all presidents and vice presidents, and they had gone through. It's kind of like a tra like a proving ground. And I go in there with this huge goal, and it's like, how do I turn this club in, you know, into a machine? It's been maxed out. It's old looking. We have competition now. There's gyms up and down the street that are brand new and, and phenomenal looking. How am I going to get a person to want to work out of my gym when the gym down the street is better and cost the same amount of money. And the way I would do it was by the team that I had. Because when people go into a gym, yes, there's equipment in there. But you know who they really show up to see every single time? It's a true story. The people that work there. Yeah, it's like cheers. Bro. Always. Yeah. Oh, a good gym has that kind of environment. And if you want that kind of retention. In fact, I used to, that was part of one of my, my sales pitch when somebody would ask me, well, why would I join here versus Gold's Gym up the street that looks so much better? And it's, well, because I don't work at Gold's. If you go work out of Gold's, you're not going to see me. But if you come here, you're going to see me. And people love that shit. And it was true. It was a true story. People would come in, they'd see me, and it was a it was a great environment. Was uh, was 506 Sunnyville your first big box that you manage? That was the first big. So I went from Salinas, yeah, yeah which <laughs> to is like Sunnyvale, small time, right? And then I ran after that. It's I did. probably how funny is that? That's probably what that that developed us that way so quickly because I had 505, which is even older. Yeah, capital than 506. And uh, arguably, like a year apart, I think. Yeah, shittier. Uh, and I had to learn that. That's exactly what we had to figure out. Like, uh, nobody, everybody had a nicer gym. Everybody had better equipment. Everybody had better everything. And so 
you had to figure out and you as uh you know i didn't get a, a break on my my revenue targets based off of that we had we had a budget we had to hit it and it didn't matter if our place was falling apart or not but you know, some of the things too like speaking to culture like what does that mean what does that look like oh, I'll, in, I'll, in a gym and i you know, one of the things that i would love to teach trainers and when we do some of these uh, seminars, when we, we go around uh, to these local gyms and we and we talk to trainers, you know, I I, I really urge them to uh, make a conscious effort every single day to proactively go on the floor and not put your head down and re-rack, re-rack weights and not pay attention, but to engage with all the people on the floor and help people. And if you got if you can actually lead a place where you've got five, 10, 15, maybe 20, if it's a big place of trainers and front desk people like Sal saying, and they walk in the door and the front desk smiles at you, smiles at you, scans you in, says something to you by your, your first name and, and makes you feel good the moment you walk in. Then you go in the locker room and change. You come out, you cross past another, a path, a, past another trainer. Trainer says something to you. Hey, what are you working out today? Oh, good to see you, Mike. And you, you can give that feel to your members Holy shit! Yeah. I don't care if your squat rack is falling apart, if your pool is green, if your if your urinal is broken. People will forgive you for all those things because you make got to make light of it. Well, look at you guys. Remember when we went to Texas? How much you guys love that gym? That was oh, one of yeah. my favorite gyms ever. Yeah. Been. Oh, it was all kinds dirty, of dirty, dusty, yeah. nothing re-racked. Like, it, but the feel and the vibe, hundred percent, smelled like powerlifter sweat. Hundred oh, percent, awesome. Here's a, here's a specific thing you can do. This was my this is like one of my calling cards. I would teach my trainers sales training constantly and i would teach my sales guys training constantly so i would have seminars with my sales guys and it was like i'm going to teach you about the human body i'm going to teach you about exercise oh yeah i'm going to teach you about fitness and fat loss and muscle building and that would make them phenomenal sales oh, it gives people. them all new talking points but my trainers they know all that shit yeah. uh, i would teach them sales training and they would exp- they would be amazing because you'd focus on those things that would make them better at their jobs and it was ex- it was always fun and exciting but the culture is everything, and I'll say this this last thing here. The person that creates and leads that culture is the manager. And if you're a manager and you spend a majority of your time in your office, you're not creating a good culture. I knew people like this. They'd sit in their office and do their paperwork and oh, that's, you know, call people in their office. To that and, point, I think mm-hmm. this is so important when you come into a new facility. Um, and this is I spend the first two weeks watching and observing. So the first two weeks, I'm not saying much. I'm just kind of sitting back. I'm letting my staff think that, oh, maybe this is a, a lazy manager who just likes to watch us and doesn't do anything. But all I'm doing is observing who is going to see me like that and let off the throttle themselves and who's going to self-regulate and manage themselves. That's who's probably I'm going to keep initially when I cut everybody else. And then after that two weeks is up, then I actually get my ass in gear and show all of them without saying anything that I can do their job better than they can. And that's so important in my opinion because in the fitness space, in gym culture, there's so much ego. And and I don't care how long you've been training, how fit you are, how many degrees you have. <laughs> so much ego. So much ego. <laughs> yes. Every fucking trainer, my whole career, okay, 10, 10 years of leading trainers uh, to this day, I'm sure if you were to ask all of them that work for me, all believe they were better than me, and that's okay. That's part of that's part of a, a, a being a good leader is is knowing that you are. You don't need to tell them that or say that. And building them up is so important. But they need to see what you're capable of if they're if they're going to respect you as a leader. And I, I think that was one of the biggest mistakes dude, I saw in my peers. Dude, I, I my my first week as a fitness manager, I was 18 years old. I'm just a kid, right, running this club. And a 35-year-old roided out bodybuilder trainer that worked for me. First week, he comes in, and I'm like, hey, man, you didn't do what I asked you. He's like, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, you're fired. And I fired him on the spot. (laughs) And he's like, this fucking kid just fired me. Yeah, get out of my gym. You're fired. Anyway, with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides, books, and information. It's all totally free. You will love it all. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. Me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.